Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over Synopsys with Gary Ruggles, and we're going to talk today about the CXL standard. So Gary, the Compute Express Link standard has been out there for probably, what, a year and something? What's, what's driving it? So a couple things are driving it. The main thing really is this, this move towards disaggregation, um, really high performance uh, computing, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, lots of needs for accelerators and things where the host and these external devices, usually accelerators, have to share data in a very intimate way and it involves caching and coherency and very low latency. What's behind it though? I mean, is this all now uh, machine learning? Is it uh, uh, high performance computing? What's the driver? So it's really both of those, high performance computing um, and machine learning slash AI, but it's also because it includes memory semantics, it also addresses memory expansion. So it allows hosts to access memory um, across uh, multiple devices in a coherent fashion as well. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So Gary, what are we looking at here? Okay, well starting here on the left, a couple of the key features of Compute Express Link are listed here. So it's an extremely low latency link. It maintains coherency so that you can share, uh, you can cache memory of the host, for example, and it's very high bandwidth. So this standard, which came out originally in March of this year, it was at first driven by Intel, and they recognized the need for um, this kind of cache coherency and high bandwidth for some of these um, high performance computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence applications, and they formed a consortium, released the CXL 1.0 version of the specification in March. And um, it's based around PCI Express 5.0 physical layer, so that means you get 32 gigatransfers per second per link, and because of the requirement for high bandwidth, uh, it's really centered around a by 16 link. So 32 gig times by 16 and you get a tremendous amount of bandwidth, the most that you can get from PCI Express. And this is just, we're dealing with more data all the time, right? Just lots more data and now you have to be able to move it through the chip, you have to be able to move it through the network. It's everywhere that this thing needs, that all this data needs to be moved. Yes, absolutely. And the, um, the desire to not have to be constantly reading and writing things back and forth from memory is kind of driving this need for coherence so that you can share aspects of memory. And the really low latency allows some of the aspects particularly that we'll get into on the memory expansion where you don't want to have these long latency cycles. Um, so uh, lots, of, lots of these features are making CXL particularly attractive to people for new designs. And this typically connects what? The, the, the chip to the external memory, the external memory to the storage, where does yeah. this fit? No, great question. So um, it's not the only cache coherence standard out there. It really focuses on connecting the host or kind of a CPU based system to some kind of a device which is typically going to be an accelerator card, an intelligent NIC card, or a memory expansion card. And it is important to note that it's kind of that one-to-one -one connection. So even though it leverages the PCI Express 5.0 physical layer and electricals, um, it doesn't have a switch. So PCI Express has these complex switches and you can have a host talking to tons of devices. This is really, at least for now, a one-to-one. -one. So you have a host to accelerator kind of connection that maintains really high bandwidth, really uh, low latency with coherency. Let's drill down into this protocol. How does it actually work? Okay, so basically what's happened is we've taken something that's built around PCI Express 5 and we've created three protocols now instead of just one. So if we look at this device here, you know, this drawing, um, you'll see we have something called CXL.io. So this is the IO protocol, and this is something that looks the most like PCI Express 5.0. Very few changes to it. It includes some things um, to allow it to work with this new um, uh, accelerator world and, and the um, CXL constructs, etc. Um, but essentially, it's a lot like a PCI Express 5 controller. And to that, it adds two other protocols, one of which I'm showing here, CXL.cache. This is our caching protocol. What it really allows you to do is for the um, uh, device here to cache through this uh, coherent bridge the host memory. So there's this kind of a connection here. And um, that's really, really great. Uh, allows this device that's going to be like an accelerator, has its own memory on board, to intimately share calculations. So they can be sharing the same memory, the host can work on it, the, the accelerator can work on it. Um, it's very efficient. 
Um, the third protocol that I mentioned is shown here, and that's CXL.mem. This is one built around memory semantics, and it's, it's a little bit different because what it's doing now, if you think about it, it's kind of the reverse of the dot .cache. So the dot .cache allows this CXL device to cache the host memory. The dot .mem allows the host to share device memory through this home agent. So it's kind of a path like this. So this is the one, the CXL.mem, that becomes really useful when we look at this third device type. So this dot mem, so this would be what's referred to in CXL as a type three device. And this is pr predominantly going to be a memory buffer or a memory expander device. So one big difference between type one, type two, and this type three that we're talking about right now is this doesn't have a computing element in here. So this is just like a memory expansion. It allows the host to coherently access all this additional memory. Um, over here, we've got accelerators. We've got smart NIC cards. We've got something going on here where we're doing some processing. So the difference between type one and type two, you can see here we just had this dot cache path here um, with the uh, co coherent sharing of the, or caching of the host memory. Um, so this is really useful for CXL devices that don't have their own memory attached. Over here, you can see we've drawn it in here. Type two devices uh, are devices which have a cache, but they also have external memory. So these might have like HBM memory, uh, where you need tons of memory for the kind of computations that are going on, but you also need this caching and it's handled coherently. So this one includes both of these um, paths. So it's got this one and this one in the type two active. Type one's got just this one and type three has got just this one. And so really what you're looking at here is the fact that there are a lot of different devices that'll be, a lot of different architectures that'll be used in order to move this data through and you have to work with all of them. Yes, um, it's interesting. You might think with three protocols that there would be more combinations than just these three. So one of the things that I didn't mention yet was that this one, CXL.io, you'll notice that's in each one of these. That's because the CXL.io being the PCIe 5 protocol essentially, that's used for all these key things. It's used for enumeration, it's used for the initial equalization, it's used for register access, it's used for DMA, it's used for address translation services. So it's used for all these kind of traditional I.O. functions. But then when it comes to actually moving the data and doing the computations and all, it basically flips from being something that looks like PCIe 5 to CXL. And one of the ways it does that is by using this new thing that was defined in PCIe 5 called alternate protocol. So that allows something other than PCI Express to run on a PCI Express fly, in this case, CXL. Any compatibility problems with PCI 5, PCI 4? P no, that's a, that's a great question. So th there's, I don't know if you'd call it a compatibility problem. There really isn't any. One of the things that, that can happen here is if you have a CPU up here, and it's you know typically going to be on a motherboard, and you've got your you know your by 16 slot here. Now you would plug normally before CXL, you'd plug a PCI Express card in there. So if you have a by 16 PCI Express card, plug that into this. If this is CXL enabled here, this will just default to PCI Express 5, and you'll never know the difference. So your PCI Express 5 device will work just fine. If you have a CXL card that takes advantage of the dot .cache and the dot .mem, the high throughput and the extremely low latency, then this, through the negotiation process, it'll say, hey, I'm CXL. The device will say, I'm CXL2. They'll negotiate this alternate protocol, and they'll switch to being CXL. Once that switch happens, they're not PCIe anymore. There's still PCIe-like traffic going over here on this .io, but the, the link is a CXL link. This used to be sort of a rarefied market with a few players in it. Now it's becoming much more mainstream, right? Because now you have all this data moving into machine learning almost everywhere. Yes, you do. That's a great point. And in fact, just the whole market of accelerators, um, I've seen some data that a huge percentage of, of some of these high computational workloads are now moving to accelerators. So this is growing, exploding. One measure of this is the consortium, which again, just started in March. It already has, as of today, I checked it this morning, 86 members. 
and it's growing very rapidly. And you know, you can see why, because there's a high demand for it. It's originally driven by Intel, um, and it's it's a really kind of neat standard that they've come up with here. So you know, we're and, and Intel's committed to it too. So one of the things they've made a public um, announcement or a blog posting of is that they'll have CXL enabled servers on the market sometime in 2021. So everybody's looking at that and saying, wow, maybe I need to enable my device, which is down here, so that I can plug in to the new CXL hosts that come out from Intel and presumably by others. Let's, let's drill down a little bit into this. What does this really look like on a, a micro level? Okay, so as I said, you've got this CXL.io uh, where you've got this um, uh, IO traffic here that's very PCI Express-like. It's essentially PCI Express. Um, one of the interesting things is in the Type 2 device, because you have this caching, you have this memory path, <clears throat> you have two uh, coherency biases that have been defined in the standard. So that allows this device, Type 2 device, to operate in what they call device bias mode, or host bias mode. So the way to think about that is the host here, you know, you've got some computational problem you're going to work on. And so initially, the host has to pass a whole bunch of information to this accelerator card. Um, so once it does that, um, then the accelerator is going to sit here and work on this. And it needs to have direct access to its own memory in a really tight, efficient way. So it will switch into device bias mode. And that means these, these pages of memory are, are exclusive to this device. So normally, when you have this kind of coherent thing, the host would kind of um, uh, moderate this, and you'd be caching this, and you'd have to go through the host to access it. But in device uh, bias mode, you don't have to do that. You have direct access. So then when you're done, um, <clears throat> you want to pass the information back, you switch to host, app, host bias mode, and now the host does uh, cache this. <clears throat> and cache coherency is ma maintained in both cases. Um, one of the other interesting things about this protocol if your readers have seen some other cache coherent things out there. This is asymmetric. And by that, what I mean is um, the home agent and the, the, the caching agent live in the host, which is the root complex. So what that means is the devices are really simple. You don't have to build all this complex coherency management logic and all that stuff. You can just build your device and all the complexity is up here in the host. The drawback, at least in the short term, is that it doesn't really lend itself to things you may have seen in the AI space of like these mesh architectures where you have accelerator, 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 and they're all talking to each other, and they're all talking to multiple hosts. But it does allow for much more heterogeneous architectures, right, which has been one of the problems yes. as we start moving forward, because there's all sorts of accelerators in these chips. Yes, and in fact, <clears throat> with this methodology, um, by putting the complexity up here, it really is CPU agnostic. So even though Intel originally drove this, if you look at the membership list, you'll see ARM is a member, um, there's other, uh, AMD is a member. So presumably you could have anybody that's building a device that's either ARM enabled, that's Intel enabled, that's AMD enabled, or who knows, maybe even RISC-V or something. They could be doing a host and they could implement CXL. And anybody's device down here, someone that built an accelerator card or a smart NIC or some memory expansion device, they could plug into it. So there are lots of different types of data coming through here. What has to happen with the data itself? So CXL has defined a 528-bit flit. So a flit, you can think of it as a small portion, if you're used to PCI Express, of what would have been a TLP or a big packet. Now, they're nicely defined so that they're always exactly 528 bits. So what that means is when you're doing these I.O. things, you might have uh, flits from this protocol and flits from these protocols mixed together. So we have something, I'm not showing it here, but it's called an arbitrator uh, multiplexer. So there's an ARBMUX block that takes these flits and kind of packs them efficiently together using a flit packing algorithm before they go out to the logical layer and out the phi. Because remember, and this is, this is a key uh, differentiator for CXL, it uses this 32 giga transfers per second PCIe 5.0 physical link. So it can use PCIe 5 mechanicals, the, this, the connectors, the chem connectors, cables that might be out there, retimers, all that stuff's reusable. Um, another interesting thing, because of the focus on high bandwidth here, <clears throat> I mentioned that it's really a by 16 32 gig. They have made allowances for some other modes. So like it supports bifurcation, meaning you can go from a single link that's by 16 32 gig down to two links of by eight or even four links of by four. But the so the main mode here though is this by 16 link. So now anything below 32 gig in speed 
or smaller in link width than these bifurcation modes are called degraded modes. So they're supported, but they're really not the target or the focus of the standard. So people aren't paying that much attention to it. So I mentioned this data flit, so it's 528 bits. It's really 512 bits plus 16 bits, two bytes of uh, CRC that go in there. And then those again are all packed together. And it helps um, the protocol maintain this, this really low latency by doing that. So it's pushing a lot of the complexity as close to the fly as possible. And the whole goal here is move data as fast as you possibly can through the chip, off the chip, and back to memory and back again into the, the processors again, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And moving, moving the um, data between host memory, cached memory, external memory on the device, or even moving um, data into external device memory through these memory expander devices. So a um, couple other interesting things too. So this is aligned with PCIe 5 at 32 gigatransfers per second. It's, it's defined as a PCIe uh, physical layer, and so the expectation by everyone is that it will follow PCI Express. So as I think every, everyone knows, uh, PCIe 6.0 was announced. So there's going to be a 64 gigatransfers per second PCIe 6.0, and everyone expects, and I think it's a correct assumption, that uh, CXL, the, some future generation of CXL, will support PCIe 6. So it has a natural path to go faster and faster just following along PCIe. But the nice thing is it doesn't have to create a whole new specification for the physical layer. It doesn't need its own FIs. I mean, if you think about it, these FIs are very complex. By the time you get to these 32 gig FIs, and now when we go to a 64 gig supporting PAM4, very expensive, expensive to license, expensive to design, and it's great that you can just go and pick up a PCI Express FI, plug that into your CXL system, and it will work. Gary Ruggles, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.